Hello everyone. A very good morning, good afternoon for the people who are sitting within US in different time zones. And good evening as well for the people who are sitting outside US and attending this webinar. I'd like to welcome you all on this webinar on the latest version 2022 of the standard ISO 27001 Information Security Management System. Uh, before I move on with my profile and brief about my company and the rest of the slides, I like to highlight that there is a chat box available in all of your dashboards. So you can enter your questions in that chat area. I will try to answer them as much as I can, as much as possible towards the end of the webinar. And for those questions which may stay unanswered, uh, we will try to formulate the answers of all of that and will circulate it, will email it to all the attendees so that all your questions will be answered. Brief about myself. So my name is Sayyid Rashad Hashmi. I'm the Director of Training at Bureau of Vita Certification North America. By profession, I'm an engineer and have more than 25 years of uh, working experience uh, as a trainer, auditor and consultant for many ISO standards. Um, the first 16 years of my career is working as a consultant and then I started working with Bureau Veritas. So it's been good 11 years working with Bureau Veritas. I've done almost 140 consulting assignments. I've done five to 600 training sessions uh, of, of diff on different international standards. And I've done a number of audits. I've done audits and trainings globally, as you can see. And I have conducted a number of IRCA trainings, IRCA certified trainings for, for ISO, different ISO standards, among which ISO 27001 is one of them. So I've done a number of lead auditor trainings on ISO 27001 information security management system. I'm also a certified information security manager, and I'm also a certified in risk and information system control by SACA. About my Veritas. So Bureau Veritas is a global leader in testing, inspection, and certification. Our mission is to shape a world of trust by reducing client risk, improving their performance, and helping them innovate to meet the challenges of quality, health, and safety, environmental protection leading to sustainability, enterprise risk management, and social responsibilities. It's a French company, so we are mostly clustered in Europe. Nevertheless, we are present in North and South America as well, and alone in North America, we have around 160 offices and labs in 50 states in Canada. So Bureau of Veritas certification offering are all these certifications. And as you can see, that some of them are generic and some of them are industry specific. Uh, like automotive industry, aerospace, they have their own certifications, food safety certifications. But then health and safety, quality, environment, information security, these are generic as well as some of them are industry specific as well. So we provide certification against all these international standards and we provide trainings against all these international standards. This is my YouTube channel. <clears throat> so people ask um, if the presentation will be available. Yes, it will be very much available. After uh, the slides will not be available, but the whole webinar will be available, the recording of this webinar. And you can well view that by going to the uh, Bureau of Veritas North America YouTube channel. And it also has um, other recordings uh, of my previous webinars and other subject matter expert webinars as well. So you can take the benefit of that. Expectations. So the initial questions and the registration that I received uh, from the attendees, um, I kind of categorized them in two things. One is, of course, the objective of the webinar, which is the latest version, 2022 version. So what is contained in there? What, what has been changed from the previous 2013 version? So that is one of the expectations and that is one of the objectives as well of this webinar. Nevertheless, I have seen some people who are new to this information security as well. So what I've done is that almost like 10% of this webinar is based on the few concepts of information security so that I'll get those people on board and there may be something new to all of you in those concepts of information security but nevertheless they are very well known. So I'll just spend a few slides on that and then I'll move on which is the main focus of my today's webinar which is the 2022 version. So the agenda that I've made for 
today's webinar comprise of the concepts of information security as I just told you and then what are the operational risks that the organization faces and then the business objectives versus information security so what is the correlation so that I can explain you that why information security is essential for every type of organization and then you must have heard the term risk assessment so I try to make a correlation on risk assessment versus information security so that you can understand the dynamics that what are the different key elements within the information security management system and how they correlate to each other and then of course I'll be discussing the new standard so what has changed um, structure wise changes then clause by clause changes then annex a the control changes so I'll go in detail about all those changes which is the very purpose of this webinar and then I'll be addressing lastly the transition and certification timelines so when it was published how the different companies who are already certified to the 2013 version what are their timelines and those who are recently going for the uh, certification so how would they go um, towards the previous certificate towards the current 2013 version or towards the new new version what are the timelines on that so I'll, dis I'll be discussing all of that and then our training schedule and context and lastly I'll be taking your questions so starting from the concepts of information uh, there's some basics that we need to address to so that we can justify uh, why the information security is necessary and essential for any so any type of organization has some organization objectives and those objectives are normally in terms of the services that can be provided and the annual turnover and the profit margin or profitability that needs to be maintained or the turnover that needs to be acquired so normally every organization has these kind of uh, different business objectives so what we need to understand is that every organization comes with the business objectives and in order to achieve those business objectives, we need the conducive working environment, a favorable working environment, a smooth working environment, so that uh, we do our operations um, on a daily basis and try to achieve the organization objective. But the working environment depends upon a number of external and internal factors. Now, external factors are pretty evident, as you can understand, and you have seen in the last past years, one of the greatest example of the external factors is the pandemic where we or any organization really did not have any control and all they learn is to respond to those uh, to those external factors so it can be pandemic it can be natural disasters earthquake or anything that is geopolitical condition anything that is out of the control of the organization that is the external factors but about the internal factors there are a lot of things which are in control of the organization and among the internal factors, what we need the most is the process and operations and the related resources. So whenever an organization set an objective, they establish that my processes and my resources will stay stable 24 by 7. And based on that, we set our organization objectives. But this is not how it goes. So in actual world, we face number of operational risks. Now, what are operational risks? Operational risk is anything that impact the organization working that can affect the organization and the achievement of organization objectives. So let me give you an overview of the type of operational risks that any organization may face and you can well make a correlation to that slide that operational risks are of different types. One is that the management information risk. So if they may not have the right information they will not be making the right decisions so the information risk is always there based on which they will make their decisions then facilities and operating environment risks so the infrastructure we need that and the risk is always there legal and regulatory compliance risk so failure to comply any litigation that risk is always there what are the what is the law of the land and then this is very well known the technology risk <coughs> So the technology risk, um, any failure in the technology part, that risk is all, always there, which impacts the organization working. Criminal and illicit act risk. So anything that is um, done by the human, by the intentional uh, damage to the organization, that is always there. And then the supplier risk, we are always 
dependent on number of suppliers. Some of them are very critical suppliers. So their commitment to supply as per agreed terms and conditions. So that risk is always there. And lastly, as I told you, the climate and weather risk. So if you may ask yourself a question that what causes these operational risks? Or let me rephrase my question that what exactly goes wrong within your organization that causes these operational risks or in simple words, the disruption in our operations. So what I've done is that I have categorized those issues, normal issues that you face every now and then within your organization in four categories. One category is the organizational and departmental level issues. Now, at the organizational level, there are a number of issues and you can see it and read it from the slide as well, that this is what we face every now and then, which may cause these operational risks to happen, which may cause the disruption in our business processes. And some of them, the important issues are these, but nevertheless, all of them are important. And we can see that that number of issues are there present in our organization as well. Unattended documents, visitor unmonitored access within the office premises, open use of public wireless networks by company top officials, open use of USBs, floppy drives. So you can see that there are a number of issues which may be true for your organization as well, or for that matter, generally speaking, any other organization. So this is at the organizational level. Then the personnel level issue, the human element. And this human element is very, very important in information security. And these are number of issues that are present at the human level. Uh, you can see some of the important issues are verbal communication about the official matters, um, document information lying on the top of the table, screen systems left unattended, um, excessive unauthorized use of telephone, mobile phones, SMS, email by the staff, and sharing the confidential information on that. So these are all the human element is there with respect to the information security. So these are all the issues that may cause the operational risk. And then the IT level issues. So I think um, every now and then we face these kind of issues in our organization. And these are some of the important issues. So IT security measure controls are based upon the IT manager and vendor recommendations. So there's no formal mechanism to ensure that how uh, the security measure should be should be placed and this mostly goes by the vendor recommendation uh, because the vendor tried to sell everything um, to uh, to an IT group um, uh, so uh, no standard operating procedure absence of storage medium disposal policies and things like that so a lot of lot of issues that we face on daily basis in our organization which may give rise to the operational lastly the supplier and issues so the external third parties as I told you that we are very much dependent, every organization is dependent on the third party. So these are some of the critical issues um, that uh, an organization faces vis a vis the third party. So critical third parties and related risk are not identified and evaluated. So we do have certain things in the terms and conditions, but there are no formal analysis or no formal risk assessment for the risk uh, that are there while contracting with certain critical third parties. So we need to understand all these issues and these are the issues which give rise to the operational. So what we can say safely is that, that the operational risks, we can reduce the operational risks by the identification and minimization of risks to business operations and related resources by ensuring information security. So the information security comes into the picture because it identifies and minimizes those risks to the business operations and our processes. That is the key element in information security. So in turn, what we can conclude out of that is that, that in today's world, the stakeholders are not just looking our, on our business plans. They also need to know that how we are going to protect our existence. And this has been proven true when we were hit by the pandemic during the year 2022 and 2021. So there's a need of formal information security management system to address all these issues to meet the organization business objectives. So we need to understand this thing that an organization does not exist to practice information security. The organization exists to achieve certain business objectives. And in that, 
information security management system play as a tool in ensuring that you achieve the business objective every time you set it. Keep in mind, uh, let's talk about the simple terms of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And I'm sure the type of people that have been registered, they're well aware of these uh, three parameters of the information. And I would not go into much of the details, but for the newbies, uh, these are the three elements or three parameters of information that we need to protect. And the preservation of these three is called as information security. So the information security is basically defined as the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information without going into any details of that. But what is important to understand here is that the Operational issues or the operational risk that I showed you, all these operational risks are usually caused by the compromise in the CIE of the information or the information assets or business processes. So we need to understand that either those issues may be caused by the compromise in the CIE or may impact the confidentiality, integrity and availability of the information, information assets or business processes. So understanding this fact that there is a direct correlation between the two what we can further that, that the organization objective which can be hit by the operational risk is basically due to the compromise in the confidentiality integrity and availability of the information this in turn also tell us that how we can minimize the compromise in the cia as confidentiality integrity and availability of information and information assets that is by doing the risk assessment now, risk assessment is the basis, is the foundation for information security management system. So I just want to highlight it on a conceptual level that when you do the risk assessment, when you find out that what are the risks to your business processes, to your information, information assets, you basically trying to reduce the level of operational risk. And the moment you try to reduce the level of operational risk, you basically try to increase the chances of achieving achievement of the organizational objective. So there's a direct correlation in the whole exercise. And information security management system really helps you as a tool in achieving your organization business objective. So these are the few concepts that I just kept in my presentation for the newbies to understand how does it all go and how this is all correlated, but I cannot go into further details of that. I will touch base on the risk assessment again when I'll be touching on the class six, when I'll be going through the slides of changes, which was the uh, 2013 version and 2022 version. So I'll come back to it again, but just understand the concept that that's how the information security management system contributes to the organizational business objective. Now let's talk about the 27001 uh, information security management system. And of course the latest version, 2022 version. So, Okay, before I do that, there's a family of standards, and I just want you to have a quick look on that, that there are a lot of supporting standards to the main 27001-2022 standard. The middle one, the 27001-2022, is basically the certifiable standard, and all the other standards are in support or provide guidance on the implementation of different elements for 27001-2022. For example, the one uh, standard that you will be um, referring to is 27,002, 2022. And I'll just tell you a correlation in the coming up slides. But just remember that these two standards will go in tandem. Um, the NXA defined in 27,001 is all taken from 27,002. And I'll explain it in the coming up slide, but just pay attention to these two standards because these are going to be my main focus in the coming up slides. Other than that, as you can see and appreciate, there is auditing guidelines for 27001 standard, which is called 27007. Now, interestingly, you can appreciate the fact that the 27001 has its own auditing guidelines, which is different than for the other standards, like for example, quality, environment, health and safety, the other 9001, 14000, 45000. There are generic guidelines, which is called 19011. 19011, which are generic guidelines which can be uh, followed for any of the uh, internal auditing for any of the standards. But for 27001, they have produced its own guidelines for auditing, which are called 
27,000 and so on. Just want to tell you the strength of this particular 27,001 standard. Ahead. So these are the standards, and I want you to focus on these two standards as I'll be referring um, in my coming slides. But there are standards uh, which are also important, and you can refer it as per the need, business need of your organization or the type of your organization. Uh, among these list, and this is not exhaustive, there are other standards as well, but among these list, um, some of the standards that are really gaining a lot of importance and a lot of uh, focus is 27701, which is on privacy information management, 2717, which is on cloud services, and 27018, which is on PII, which stands for personally identifiable information. So these are the three standards which are gaining a lot of focus in the market and a lot of interest in the market. Nevertheless, you can use any of these standards, um, guidelines, to further strengthen your information security. And there's an exhaustive list uh, which you can refer in the bibliography of 27001 and 27002 for further sector specific standards. So anyone wants to go um, have gain further knowledge on that, you can refer the bibliography of these standards. Now, what has changed? So you can see this is the 2013 version and this one is the 2022 version. So the first thing that has changed is the addition it's called second edition and this is the third edition. So the first 27,001 came in 2005, 2013 was the second revision and this is the third revision which is 2022. It's published exactly in 25th October 2022. The other thing that they have changed is the title. So it says information technology security technique. Now it says information security, cyber security and privacy protection. So you can see that the title has been changed. Now this is the um, contents for previous standard, 2013, so that I can make a correlation with that. So I hope everyone can recall, whoever is aware that this is a 10 clause structure, and among that 10 clause, these are the same 10 clauses which are present in most of the ISO standards. So I believe whoever is aware of the 27, and most of you must have been aware of the 27001 previous version, you must be aware of this contents side of it. Now let's have a look at the new and what has been introduced new. So this is the 2022 content site. And if you compare the 27001, the previous standard and the new standard, you can see that all of it is same. The structure is exactly identical with few minor changes. One of them is that if you can see, like for example, 6.1. So here they have included the contents, the sub clauses, 6.1, 6.2 and 6.3. Here, it was not written, but very much included. So do not think that when they are writing the sub clauses, it was not written here in the contents page, except for few clauses, which are my ninth clause and 10th clause. So when I'll come to the ninth and 10th clause, I'll explain you that uh, the structure has been changed here, the sub clause wise. But other than that, the 7.5, if you look at the 2013 7.5, you'll find the same um, the structure, the subclass structure, as you see on the left side in the new version. So there's not much change here. Nevertheless, one thing, a few changes that they have made is the introduction. So if you can see, there was a zero in the introduction and they have removed it. There's no zero. And they try to align it with the rest of the ISO standard. I do not know why they have put zero earlier here because all the other standards does not have, also do not have the zero here. So that is one change. There's another change and this is about a clause and there is an error in 27001-2022 version and if you see the 6.2 clause they have added a clause which is 6.3 planning of changes and it is not listed in the contents page so it has definitely been missed out to be written in the contents page nevertheless this is very much present in the new version and this is explained in the new version, the planning of changes, and I'll explain to you when I'll reach the class six, and this has been definitely missed out to be present in the 27001. It will not, uh, it will not give um, any, it will not implicate anything on your, on your implementation and auditing, just that you should know so that you would not get confused when you go back to your organization. So this is the structure of the 27001, 2022, not much different than what we had in 2013. And out of that, the 
4 till 10 clause plus annex A. These clauses are called auditable clauses. So we can well segregate the standard in two parts. One part is related to the uh, part one, which is about the management system. And this is the part two, which is about the uh, controls uh, that, that is required uh, to be implemented. So the relationship between these two is like this. So the objective of the information security is the preservation of CINA, as I told you. And this 4 till 10 establishes the, the information security management system. And when you are establishing the information security management system, the six clause asks for the risk assessment. And within six, there is a clause 6.1.3, 6 which asks for risk treatment. And while doing the risk treatment, you need to place controls and those controls are defined in Annex A of the 27001. And I've written here 27002. This is where you refer the, the other standard. I hope you can recall when I told you, when I was showing you the family of ISO standards, 27001, that these are the two standards which go in tandem. So 27001 needs to be read along with 27002, especially when you are referring to the Annex A controls. So when you will be referring those 27002 controls, that will be uh, when you will be doing the risk treatment in class 6.1.3. So moving ahead, the Annex A, a little explanation on Annex A. Uh, now the new standard is coming with four domains with 93 controls. If somebody may not uh, be able to recall, the previous standard was having 14 domains in 114 controls. And I'll just show you the next slide that how it was for your ready reference. But just to emphasize, so these are the uh, four domains, organizational controls, people control, physical control, and technology control. So they have converted into four domains and these are the clause numbers, A5, A6, A7, A8. So when you see the Annex A of 27001, you will find this numbering. But this numbering has been taken from 27,002. So in 27,002 at A5, start addressing the organizational controls, people control, physical control, and technology controls. So these control, the four domain has these sub-controls, and these controls total to 93 here. Just for the reference, this is the previous version, and previous version used to have 14 domains, and they used to have 114 controls. So these are the controls within each domain, and this is this is the description. This is just for the quick reference so that you can make a of that. So let's go with the clauses uh, from 4 till 10 and what has been changed and what has been newly. So the 4 till 10 clause following the same uh, philosophy of plan, do, check, and act. I hope most of you are well aware of that. And among that, 4 till 7 clauses are about planning and 8 is about operations. And 9 is about performance evaluation, checking, and 10 is about improvement. So it is following the same cycle of PDCA. And there's nothing much changed, which is the good news for the people who are already certified to the 2013. So let's start with the class 4. Nothing much changed in class 4, except for that, that there is a requirement which has been added, requirement of interested parties to be addressed through ISMS. Now, personally, I would think that whatever has been changed. This was really there before as well, but it was all implied. Now they've made it very explicit. So when we were working on the 2013 version of the 27001, we did address all of that, which was very much implied in this standard, but now they've made it very explicit to make it more meaningful. So they have really aligned it with the practical working, especially you will see within the control section that how well they have aligned all of that. Uh, class 5, there is no change, and I will not go into the details of that. This is all about leadership, um, how to commitment and the policy and the organizational roles and responsibilities. So let's focus on the objective of this webinar, which, uh, which are about the changes. So I'll go through just the change part. of. It. Now, in class 6, there has been some significant changes. So one of the change is that that the IS objective, the in, within 6.2, you need to establish information security objectives. So they have Put it as objectives are to be monitored, objectives to be available as documented information. Uh, they've made it explicit. It was very much implied. Like, for example, if you talk about objectives to be monitored, now 
in the other clause 9.3 management review objective needs to be reviewed so in order for you to review the objectives they must need to be monitored so the monitoring part was there before but it was implied now they have made it explicit so it's just the matter of that they are aligning it well and making it explicit for the organization uh, to make it more meaningful nevertheless it was all there and i could not see any new thing here uh, till class 6 uh, the risk assessment methodology treatment everything is just like the same we did in 2013 version now here's the thing the new class planning of changes i hope you can recall this is one of those clauses which has been missed out to be present in the contents page of the 27001 2022 version now you can see that changes to the assets to be carried out in a planned manner this was addressed before as well in change management process within a1212 and a14 controls and there are a number of other places where it addresses about the change management but i believe what they are trying to highlight is the planning part of it because earlier they were talking about controlling the changes um, of course in order for you to control it you need to plan it well so this was implied now they made it explicit another thing another reason that i could understand why they have put 6.3 is to align it with other standards as well so the other standard structure also has 6.3 and they align it with the other structure and highlighted the planning of changes part so this was new and this is where uh, this content page, I hope you can recall that how this was missed out in the content page, but do remember that this is very much part of the standard. Then I have put a slide again for all of you or for the newbies as well, that how this, this risk assessment works. So when you do the risk assessment for different threats or based on assets or based on your processes, so whichever way you want to do the risk assessment, and you set a scale of risk, let's suppose one till 10 or one till 25 or whatever, then you will come up with different risk values uh, for your different threat analysis or for your different asset analysis. And once you are coming up with these different values of risk, then there is acceptable level of risk and there's an unacceptable level of risk. So you need to define a threshold value, which is called the acceptable risk value. Based on that, you will compare and evaluate which are your significant risks so that you can work on those significant risks which are unacceptable risk and lower their risk value down by placing controls where the risk treatment pro process comes in which is by 6.1.3 so this is exactly the area where you will be referring to all those best security practices as defined in the four domains and 93 controls in annex a of the latest 2022 version so i hope this graphical presentation gives you an gives you an overview that how this risk assessment would look like and where this is all going towards and how this all is correlated with each other. So this is how it goes. Moving on again, focusing on the changes only. Uh, the class seven, there's no change in that. Um, the only change is content wise that they have put the uh, these sub clauses 751, 752, 753 in the, on the contents of the 2022 version. Uh, otherwise there's no change. I would not go into the details of this. Now in eight clause, there's one interesting change. And I really want to highlight that one change, which is about the establishing criteria for operational processes and implementing controls of the processes. Again, as I said earlier, that this was very much implied because once you establish the risk assessment and once you list down a control, you really cannot follow the control unless you establish the criteria or doing that control and I'll give you a simple example but let's first let me show you the standard that. so this is the clause and this is the area which has been newly introduced that establishing criteria for the processes and implementing controls of the process in accordance with the criteria so as I said that this was pretty much implied but now they have made it explicit this is also aligning with other standard write-up as well so what do you mean by establishing criteria for the processes? Let's suppose you are coming up with uh, password management. Now, this password management, as we all face in our organization, um, we need to go alphanumeric. We cannot, we need to do it every three months. And we cannot uh, use the same password as we have used it for the last five times or ten times and things like that. Uh, it should have a special character. So we define all these policies and uh, for the password management. 
who will do it, how will it be installed, and, um, and, and things like that. So this is what is called establishing the criteria for the processes. So whatever the process that you are establishing, whatever the controls that you are establishing, you need to uh, establish the criteria for that. How will you go about it and how the process will take place? Who will be responsible for that? And this is the technical side control or technical side process. Let's talk about the um, non-technical. For example, visitor escorting policy. Now, how will that happen? When a visitor arrive, arrives at your premises and they need to meet somebody, so how would they be escorted when they meet someone or what is the escorting policy about that, who will do it and how you're going to uh, make it happen on the ground. So you need to establish the criteria for different kind of technological as well as non-technological processes and controls and then you need to implement it. And again, the documented information is dependent upon the organization that how much you like to document it. So, so you need to understand that they have, this was implied and now they have made it pretty explicit that you need to establish the criteria. So this is one of the things. Uh, in the ninth and 10th clause, there is really no change. And if you can recall, I told you in the contents page that what they have done is that, that they have added these structure, these clause, sub clauses, 921, 922, and 931, 932, and 93. So earlier it was just one clause, 9.2 and 9.3. Now they have added it sub clauses to align with the other ISO standard structure because in all the other standards you will see that 9.2 will have two sub clauses and 9.3 will have three sub clauses. One thing that they have added apart from the structure is a requirement within the 932, which is 932C that changes the needs and expectations of the interested party. So among the inputs, among the other inputs that you need to discuss within the management review, this is one of the other management review inputs that you need, you may need to discuss. Clause 10, no change. So I will not go into the details of that. Rather, I would like to jump to the Annex A, uh, which has some significant controls. Uh, changes in... I hope you can recall, uh, I showed you this slide. This was the regarding the previous version. 27,001, 2013. So 14 domains and 114 controls. Now let's see what do they have in 2022 version. So as I told you earlier, this is four domains and 93 controls. In totality, it looks something like this. So this was the NXA, uh, 114 controls with 14 domains in 2013 version. And this is 22, 2022 version and four domains and there are 93 controls. So what they've done is that there are new controls, uh, 11 new controls. And to be honest, again, I am of the view that they were very much there. They're implied controls, except for a few, except for a few, but they were very much there. Now they've made it quite explicit. So, uh, and as I'll go through those new controls, I'll explain you that part as well. Now, among that, 24 controls from, 24 controls from merging two or more of 23, 2013 controls. So at the end, I put a slide which will show you that comparison as well. And I'll give you further reference from where you can look into that how the 2013 114 controls have been merged. Some of them have been merged into the 24 controls, almost like 56 to 58 controls from 2013 version have been merged to 24 controls. And the rest are updated to align with 2022 version. So they, were, they, were, they are there, but they have been updated. Uh, yeah, there are two tables which you can refer to, B1 and B2 of 27,002. So remember that these details are available in 27,002, 2022 version for further details, the B1 and B2. This is the other standard, the guidelines for control. So let's talk about the Annex A. So these are the four domains. So anything that may be concerning the individual, anything that has a physical object, concern the physical object, anything that has to do with the technology and the rest which are not falling into the three domain they are all organizational controls so that's how they have categorized uh, they've introduced so this is the nx a outlook and as you can see that um, in 27001 this is how it will look it's it says five as i told you that it's it will start with five till eight and basically these are these are uh, taken, these numbering are taking, taken from the 27,002. So this is where you need to refer the 27,002 uh, for further guidance and implementation um, guidance for these controls. 
Now the 27,002 looks like this and it came before 27,001 2022 version and this was revised in back in March uh, 2022. So it was a little earlier, like almost six, seven months earlier than, than, the, than the main standard. And as I told you, these are implementation guidelines for all the controls that is defined in Annex A of 27,000. So the look of the 27,002 is something like this. So the 5.1 that I earlier showed you, this will be having this table within 27,002. And this is a new thing. So what they have done is that they have added certain attributes. What are these attributes? I'll just explain you in my next slide. Um, but these are certain attributes that they have added for better understanding of the controls. And then in place of the control objectives, they have changed the heading and called that as the purpose. So that is the only change that they have introduced. But this really gives a lot of meaning to the control thing. How? I'll just explain. So these are the control attributes. Uh, there are different attributes as you saw in, uh, in that five column table in the previous slide. Control type, security properties, cyber security framework concepts, operational capabilities and security domains. So what I can tell you is that the control types, there are three types, preventive, detective and corrective. And as the name implies, before something happens at the time it's happening and after it has happened and a threat has been materialized and you are responding to it, that's the corrective nature of uh, control. So these are the control types that that has been mentioned. The security properties, whether it is impacting the confidentiality, integrity, availability, or both, or two of them, or all three of them. Um, cyber security framework concepts. So there are certain cyber security framework concepts, and as you can see, there's a lot of overlap. So identify and protect is all covered in the preventive nature of control. Detect is detective, and corrective is respond and recover. So this will again help the cyber security companies or the uh, to to really identify the control, what is best for them. Um, the operational capabilities is really for the implementers, where exactly these controls should be implemented. Is it related to governance? Is it related to physical security? Um, is it related to threat and vulnerability management, continuity? So operational capabilities gives an implementer exactly the idea where this should be followed and complied with on the ground. So operational capability will give you that further insight about the control. And then security domains. So these are all information security domains. Um, like for example, the governance domain, which talks about the information security governance and risk management. Uh, this basically this ecosystem is ecosystem cyber security management, including internal and external stakeholders. Um, protection is about IT security architecture, IT security administration. Uh, and within defense, you can have detection, uh, computer security incident management, and resilience is all about continuity of operations and crisis management. So these are the information security domain. And the reason why they have put it this way is that so that the related organizations can be able to identify the controls uh, within their uh, within their domain and vis-a-vis -vis the type of the organization that they are, they are. So the attributes are used because they are generic enough to be used by different type of organization. Organization can choose to disregard one or more of the given attributes. So remember this thing, my friends, that this 27,002 is not the main standard. This is there to explain you the implementation of the controls that is defined in Annex A of the 27,001. So 27,001 is the main standard. And within that, the Annex A is the requirement. And to help you in the implementing and provide you some guidance on the implementation side of those controls and to better understand different attributes of those controls, 27,002 is there and that is how and that is why it is structured that way to provide you further insight towards those. Now these are the new structure controls and um, uh, as I've given you earlier as well. So get to the new controls now. Uh, these are the 11 new controls and I'll quickly go through them. Uh, one. So threat intelligence is all about uh, the different type of threats that you may be having, uh, anyone may be having, and uh, you can get the market or can get the knowledge from your own uh, incidents and can do the threat intelligence. This is just like marketing intelligence that salespeople do. So you can well prepare proactively for your uh, uh, for the for the security of your organization if you do the threat intelligence and get to know about these threats. So there's a control. Again, it was implied. Now they've made it pretty. Um, 
information security of use of cloud services. The cloud services has become the part of the thing. Everyone is using cloud. So what are the considerations to that? A lot of good information is provided. Um, uh, what are the security requirements to be considered? How to establish the selection criteria? What will be the process for acceptable use of cloud? Uh, and, and things like that. So uh, there are a lot of information provided in 27,002 standard. Um, uh, um, the implementation guide, guidelines and that can help you big time in understanding those clauses. Then we have the ICT readiness um, uh, and again as I told you that for business continuity whenever we used to plan there was a previous control in the previous standard which was uh, continuity um, uh, and resilience. Uh, I believe that was a 17 yeah that was a 17 control in 2013 version. So this is specific to information and communication technology that how would you go for the business continuity of uh, information and communication, uh, how you need to establish the uh, recovery time objectives, uh, recovery point objectives and the whole business, business continuity concept very specific to the ICT. So they have made it a specific clause um, nevertheless it was very much there earlier in A17 clause in 2013, it was not that explicit, it was uh, physical security monitoring, as I told you that there was a previous clause, which is called A9, which talks about the physical security. This is same clause, but they have made it pretty explicit that how to do the monitoring of the site of the premises. And a lot of uh, good information is available there. Then we have configuration management. So as I said that configuration management is all about the uh, configurations on your networks and on your hardware and software. Uh, who will access what, what are the security settings, um, how your routers and switches will be configured, um, how your firewalls will be conf configured and things like that. So this is all about configuration management, who's authorized, who's authorized to access, how will you audit those, um, your tools and your, um, uh, your configuration management, uh, who's the configuration manager and things like that. So, so they have emphasized a lot about uh, different configurations um, with respect to uh, the different um, uh, different uh, network and different um, IT infrastructure that you use. Uh, that how do you ensure the configuration there? Uh, information deletion, as I told you, that this was very much there previously in the standard. It was pretty implied. Um, now they have made it explicit that uh, delete it and what should be the policies and procedures that you may need to follow with respect to the information deletion. Data masking is one of those techniques where you basically um, um, hide the uh, PII, which is personally identifiable information data. And there are few techniques that is used to be followed. Uh, this is uh, relatively a new, star, a new thing, uh, relatively, because it was again employed, but not that, that much employed. But data masking, there are a number of techniques that company follow. One of the uh, way is called pseudonymization. And anonymization um, uh, which are different techniques to hide the personally identifiable information so what are the principles that you need to follow how will you go about it um, in um, uh, in pseudonymization uh, you can um, re-identify the data by applying and mapping in reverse so uh, pseudonymization does not result in an anonymized data like in anonymization you cannot recover the data it's, it's all gone uh, so, so these are different techniques uh, that is defined within data masking and you may consider. Um, then data leakage prevention, again, a lot of good information in 27,002. You can go into the details of that, how to protect uh, the, leakage of the uh, leakage of the data. And again, as I said, this is very much a threat before as well. And we were considering that um, in 27,001, 2013 version, but this has been highlighted as a control. Uh, monitoring activities, different logs, different who's doing what, especially the admin to the networks and the admin to the to the servers, how their activities have been monitored. So this was again addressed before. Now they've highlighted in a, in a separate clause, in a separate control, which is eight. Uh, web filtering, uh, what is allowed within the web, and I think we all know it very well. We all face it. Every uh, how our IT, um, our own company's IT policies are protecting and placing different filters so that uh, no malicious activity and no unauthorized access can be made through the web. So how the web filtering will take place, who will do what, 
and what is the acceptable use policy a lot of good information uh, secure coding this is all about the coding principles and how do you do the coding within the so if you are doing the software development in-house even if you are getting it um, done through the outsides or you are using certain open source open source software how will you make sure that those uh, open source software are securely uh, coded and secure uh, from the point of uh, view of uh, no unauthorized access can be made through those open source software so how do you ensure the security of that uh, and the third party softwares uh, and and how do you establish your own secure code uh, this is the slide that I was trying to um, uh, place, which is about the merge controls. And as you can see, a uh, lot of good things they have done. And honestly, I love this slide because while I was explaining the 2013 version, there's a lot of repetition. And just take one example, this 832 change management. This was addressed like in three or four different clauses. Change management about the operations and processes Chain system change control. This is in the in the in the echo in the software development cycles, technical review of applications. So changes were addressed in the previous version in number of controls, but now they have all merged it into one control. Similarly, if you see the logging, uh, the event log, protection of log information, administrative operator, they have all merged it in the into the one control, which is 850 logging. Uh, similarly, if you see storage media, management of removable media disposal, so there are a number of other controls which is addressing one and the same issue in different dimensions and they have beautifully merged it in one control which makes life easier for, for all the implementers and for all the auditors and for all the instructors as well. So it makes a lot of logical sense to have these combined controls and I tell you what, um, while you are working within your organization, um, this table B1 and B2 of 27,002. So this is the other guideline standard for controls. This will help you big time in making these correlations where you have implemented and how, um, how you can take the benefit and uh, merge these controls. So, so technically um, uh, on the implementation side of it, you may really do not need to do much because if you are implementing all these chain management and all these procedures, it's just that this has been addressed in AT2 change management. So you do not need to do practically anything here, but all that you need to do is to make sure that this has all been aligned with the, with the change management clause, that's it. Otherwise they've been merged into these things. Um, so these were my merge controls. Now, um, as I've taken a little more time than 45 minutes, but these are some of the important topics that I really want to address. So about the certification and transition timelines. So you need to understand few dates um, as I've written it here. So October 2022 is the, is the time when the new standard was published in 25th October 2022. And these are some of the timelines. So the first timeline is important for the companies who are already certified to 27,001. They need to transit to 27,001 2022 by October 2025. That is three year cycle. So these companies can still go for the surveillance audits on the previous 2013 version as well. And then sometimes after like October 2024 or after April 2024, whenever they like, they need to transit to 2025 version. So that is one important thing that they can understand. But in between, they can do the surveillance audit on the previous version as well. Now, there's one set of companies which may be going for the 27,001-2013 certification for the first time. Or there may be companies who are certified already and going for a recertification cycle. Now, the certification or recertification to the current 27,000-2013, I should not call it current, let's call it previous version, is it still valid till either October 2023 or April 2024. Now this is the certification body decision. So whoever your company is certified to, you need to ask that what is the timeline that the certification body is giving you that they can still provide you a certificate, initial certification or recertification against the previous version, which is the 2013 version, okay? But after April 2024, there would not be any initial or recertification on the previous version and everything has to be on the new version. 
So this is one thing that you need to pay attention to for those companies who are uh, in the phase of implementation and about to acquire 2013 version certification or who are about to complete their three-year cycle, let's suppose by um, December or by December 2023 or by October 2023 and they need to see that if the recertification can be done on the previous version and then they will upgrade their systems to October uh, till before October 2025 to the new version 2022 version and lastly as per certification body again either by October 2023 or by April 2024 all the certification and recertification will only be on 27,001 so there will be some certification bodies who may offer uh, the certification uh, to the previous version during this period, October and April, but everyone will not be offering the previous version certification after 2024. So, so I've written these three categories to make you understand that how this all will go and how this all will look like. With that, uh, I'm reaching the end of my webinar and I will try to take few questions and again, excuse me if I'm taking a little more time than 45 minutes. I've kept the 10-15 uh, minutes for the Q&A after my 45 minutes slides, but it has taken longer, which is important to be addressed. The topics were important to be addressed. So uh, we offer these public and virtual classroom trainings, and you can contact our training coordinator, Ms. Diana Cruz. These are their numbers. Um, our training website is bureauofitastraining.com slash US. And... Um, just our website and you can download our latest training calendar from there. Uh, as I told you that by this webinar will be very much available on the uh, YouTube channel of Bureau Vitas North America. So again, you can uh, download, you can listen to this, uh, my presentation again. Uh, I would not be able to share my slides uh, as per company policy, but this will all be available very much to you through our Bureau Vitas YouTube training channel. And these are contacts um, for the uh, certification services if you are interested. And I'm very much available for any technical queries that you may have even after the webinar. So you can note down my numbers and you can note down my email. I'm very much available. Uh, so my let's go ahead with a few of the questions. Um, and as I can see that there are a number of questions uh, which has been um, um, entered while you were registering. And then there are a number of questions um, I can see that has, has been coming up through the webinar as well. So I'll try to answer some of the key questions. And then as I told you that rest, I will be answering later on. Um, uh, I will be writing my responses and then we will circulate those answers uh, to all the attendees here. So let's go ahead with a few questions. Uh, one of the uh, questions that um, was regarding that what has been changed. So I think I've answered that that part of it. Uh, the other one is regarding the relationship between the 27001 and CMMC and and SOC 2 and 9001 and other other standards. So I can tell you one thing is that that all these uh, CMMC SOC 2 these are all information security frameworks and there's a lot of similarity between the two. Now it really goes with the business need of the organization. So who's asking for CMMC, if you are working for the government organization uh, and you are a supplier, then you should go for that. But if you are 27,001 certified, that will help. That will greatly help you um, in going for any other any other certification as well. Be that CMMC, be that be that SOC two. So it really depends upon what type of environment and what type of scenario you are in, and how would you like to uh, go about that. So this is all about that. Um, the other thing is regarding the. The other thing is regarding the, the other question is regarding the are there any um, plan of action and milestones uh, the gap listed so that can be specifically work with direction. What I can tell you is that that regarding this um, 27001 if you pay attention the 4 till 10 clause has not been changed much. OK, so those companies who are already certified to 27001 2013 version, they do not need to worry. All that you need to focus upon is the new controls. The new 11 controls that I've mentioned, all that you need to do is to focus on that and see how they are addressed within your uh, within your organization. As I told you that they were pretty much implied, so they were they 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 much they must be there within your organization. But you need to highlight it and you need to align it with the with the new requirements of the standard so that you can make a correlation out of that. You need to make a, you need to revise your statement of applicability SOA 
uh, you may need to revise your review or risk assessment as well and then you need to align your controls with respect to the to the new structure so that you need to really work on on the control side rather than the implement that than the management system side so four to ten clauses are really do not require much changes as such which is a good news because that's the main standard but controls with respect to controls you really need to align so the main document that will be uh, that will be impacted is the SOA which is your statement of applicability and your risk assessment you need to see how these controls especially the new controls have been have been addressed there um, there's one other question um, how are this other standards documentation to be handled, uh, which are still building on the 27001, 2013 version structure example, 27701, 2717, and 2718. So these are all those standards which I showed you earlier, which was on privacy management, on PII, and on cloud services. So remember, my friends, that all these other standards, these are all guidelines. And these are guidelines for the controls implementation in different elements of the 27001. This is perfectly you all call. The eighth standard, uh, the 8.1 specifically talks about that the extent of documentation depends upon the structure, uh, the business needs of the organization. How much you want to document, that's your call. That's the business need of the organization. Just document as much as you need so that it will not make it cumbersome for the people to follow. So that is one thing that you need to keep in mind. Uh, one last question let me take because I've touched one hour, 60 minutes here. And this is one of the most interesting questions that I have seen. And this is about what is the most common and unnecessary thing you see companies implement in their ISMS that gives very little value to a business. So this is one of the very, very interesting questions that I received. And I really like to take one or two minutes of yours to touch base on this one. So one of the things that I have seen is too much of documentation. And, and they just do it to impress the auditor. Uh, try to make the system for your people rather than to get certification. That is one thing. Second thing is that, that people do not understand the uh, benefits of the risk assessment. And again, they do it for the sake of the documentation. Try to understand that thing um, and try to take the benefit out of that risk assessment. I've shown you an equation. There's a whole lot of, um, I, can, I do webinars, I do uh, courses on that risk assessment. And it really, it really changes the whole security posture of your organization. If you